Welcome everyone. This is the first of hopefully several uh, of what I'm calling the HFI Tech Lunches. Um, this is part of the HFI Kenya 2020 program. So our first discussion here today is going to be on fuel composition, proximate to ultimate fuel composition explain. So I'm going to do the way that this is going to work is I'll do a short uh, discussion here um, explaining some background on the topic. That should be around 10 minutes. I might go a little bit longer. And then I thought we can reserve the remaining time, maybe about 20 minutes if possible, uh, just to discuss the topic, the relevance to your company, any questions and ideas that we have for a, another tech lunch next time. So I think uh, one thing is there's a lot to discuss and even in this just this introductory topic. So um, I'm going into a little bit of depth, but uh, in later sessions, I'll actually build on what we're talking about here. So if you still have some unanswered questions, we can talk about those and hopefully I'll address them better uh, in the next sessions. So the learning goals here are we will hopefully have answered what is meant by composition when we talk about fuel or biomass composition or even your briquette composition. What are the proximate and ultimate analysis or analyses? There's two types of analysis that we're going to introduce here, although there's there's a few others that people use as well, but these are the most common. We'll actually talk most about proximate analysis, a little bit less about ultimate. And why is this important for char briquettes? So first, uh, just very generally, what is composition? So it's the uh, complete set of individual components that make up a whole. That's the way that I'm defining it. And so it's not only an idea that we use in fuels and biomass and combustion but you can think of music is made up of many notes and a structure uh, that that composes a song uh, individual ingredients for a meal are composed all together to make uh, food and then even artwork has these ideas of composition these seven elements that make up uh, a piece of art. So for us, we're going to talk about biomass composition. And in this case, there's a definition we use. So the biomass is a complicated arrangement of a lot of different types of chemicals when you kind of break it down on the um, structure, say under a microscope or even smaller than that, um, at the kind of atomic level. We have these basic structures. Uh, carbohydrates are the major one, and other uh, compounds, cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin, lipids, protein, simple sugars, starches, hydrocarbons, ash, and water. So, let's see. These all, so the, the arrangement of these, how much and the proportion of each of these, they depend on the type of plant, so the species, which part of the plant. So for example, with trees, you know, the main trunk and the bark and the branches and the leaves all have different composition, right? So if we want to know something about, say, the energy uh, content or the, the quality of a specific material for, say, making char, uh, we'll need to know about all the parts of that plant, um, ideally. And usually, kind of as yeah, in sort of science, you use like this arrangement, which sort of aligns with what I just presented uh, ash, protein, fat, starch, sugar, organic residues, hemicellulose, cellulose, and lignin. And Basically, these are kind of the building blocks for all organic matter, including the human body, right? So um, you, you've probably heard about hemicellulose, cellulose, and lignin. Those are sort of the main structural parts of the biomass. 
and a lot of these others are other components or maybe used for transport of energy or uh, material throughout the plant during its life. Um, maybe those biodegrade quickly after they, the plant dies or uh, is cut. Um, so yeah, we'll keep going. So the first type of analysis, it's a term called proximate. So if you're, if you've had some lab testing done on your product, then maybe you've actually heard about this and, and you know something about it. Actually, if you know about the KEB standards also, then proximate analysis, I think is something you've probably heard in those discussions. So by definition, uh, the proximate analysis describes the fuel in terms of the contents. Would, sometimes we use the word fractions of uh, of the material uh, by mass of these four components. So one is moisture content, two is volatile matter, and I'll talk about what each of these are. Um, three is ash, and four is fixed carbon. So we sort of, instead of using all of the lignin, cellulose, hemicellulose, all of those, we're actually going to sort of lump a bunch of those molecules into these four categories. And these are really useful, especially when we're thinking about uh, using the biomass for some kind of thermal application. Say we're going to burn it, you know, to produce heat, or we're going to pyrolyze or carbonize it to make another material like char. So this, this type of analysis will give us a sense of um, what might happen during that process and what we're going to be left with at the end. Okay, so first is moisture content. And probably most of us know about this. Um, so moisture content, it's, it describes the water in the, the biomass. And one important distinction is it's what we call physically bound water. So this is the water that's naturally present. It's not actually produced when we're uh, converting the biomass, say, into heat. So you might know when we combust wood or any other material, actually, we actually produce a lot of water vapor as a product of that reaction. Um, but in this case, we're not counting that water. You now that'll come later after we're using uh, the material. So typically, we want to keep the moisture content as low as possible. Um, although I, I will say there, a little bit of moisture actually can have some benefit. You can actually activate some interesting chemical reactions. We'll talk about those another time. Um, but there could be a benefit to having a small amount. But in general, we want to try to dry material as much as possible. The second piece is called volatile matter, volatile matter, VM. Um, these are the components of the fuel that are released in an inert atmosphere at high temperatures using a slow heating rate. So a couple of terms here. Uh, one is inert. So this means non-reactive. Usually it, we can think of it as just meaning there's no oxygen present. So actually when we're carbonizing or pyrolyzing, ideally we kind of completely remove the material from any air or oxygen uh, accessing it. And this means that we won't combust the material. So instead we're heating it up to a high temperature, ideally a bit slower than, you know, say just uh, in an uncontrolled manner. And this is this causes a rapid release of anything uh, in the biomass that has a boiling temperature. So water would be the first component at 100 C. Water will turn to steam, and uh, it will exit the maize cobs. Then at higher temperatures, you have other components, some oils and some hydrocarbons, different a lot of different species that come out of the material. Um, and we can track that if we have a, an accurate way to measure um, that mat the material before and after heating it. So we usually keep it, when we're doing this in a lab, we usually keep the, the sample. 
say the briquette sample in an inert atmosphere by putting this material in a little oven and injecting some nitrogen. So we know that nitrogen is not fairly non-reactive. And so there won't be any combustion. You won't have any oxygen reactions that would cause volatile matter or other things to also um, burn away from the sample. Okay, so the next one, uh, two more, fixed carbon is another ter term you may have heard of. And this basically, we don't have a great definition for this, but it's basically just the material remaining after the release of the volatile matter. So we've heated up the material up to 950 C, very hot, but in an inert atmosphere, an inert environment. And whatever's pretty much everything remaining, we'll call fixed carbon. And it's generally, you know, what we would observe as char. You know, the remaining stuff, it looks like char. Although it does still have ash, right? The ash hasn't burned away. A lot of the ash is non-volatile. So it would remain with the fixed carbon. So actually we have to do one last test, even after heating it to 950C, we have to actually combust it and burn away everything remaining. The fixed carbon is now burned away. Uh, and that leaves the ash. And so we call that the residue remaining after drying and combustion of the volatile and fixed carbon fractions. So, in in reality the way we determine the ash then in the lab is while we still have the material up to 950 c we then introduce oxygen and that way the fixed carbon reacts very quickly with the oxygen in that hot environment and uh, we're left with just the ash ash is basically the inorganic content of the biomass so when it's growing it takes up some metals, some salts uh, from the soil, and different plants will take up different amounts and different types of inorganic material. Uh, silica is a common one, chlorine is a common one, and um, those help aid in the plant's growth, and then they remain within the plant material, the biomass, after the plant is harvested. So it's important because we're stuck with the ash from the beginning. And that that actually has a big impact on us later on when we're trying to use biomass for different, especially for thermal applications. If we're going to be stuck with it all the way until the end, until the end user actually uses our product. Okay, so let's keep going. We'll talk, I'll talk about a couple more things on proximate analysis. So just, I talked a little bit about how we do this in the lab, but this will give you a little sense. So we measure moisture in a drying oven. Um, so actually the way we measure all of these things is using an accurate scale, a balance. Um, and usually it's, you know, very accurate down to say the milligram or even microgram. So you take a sample in the very beginning, you weigh it, then you put it in your drying oven, heat it up to 105 C, leave it for uh, eight to 10 hours. So it has enough time to um, release all of the moisture Then take it out of the drying oven, weigh it again. So now we have a difference. And from that difference, we can calculate the um, approximate the moisture content. So the next step, like I said, we put it into a little bit different device now much higher temperature so we have a what's called a muffle furnace is the most common thing so it probably at QRD at University of Nairobi Kefri where they're doing this testing they have each of these devices so this is lined with ceramic so it can sustain the high temperatures and it has electrical heaters to create that hot environment and in most cases, you have an option to plug in a tank of nitrogen or something like that to make it inert. So we heat the sample up to 950 C. The volatile matter comes out of it, and we're left with the fixed carbon. Then we add the 
oxygen into that environment. We weigh again at each of these steps, we're getting a mass, right? So we want to see the, the mass loss at each step. We introduce oxygen, everything has burned away by that point, and now we're just left with the ash. Um, so you may wonder though, so from here to here, I've kind of skipped over the fixed carbon, right? Because after we remove the volatile matter, we're still left with ash content and fixed carbon. So the most common way, it's actually difficult to measure the fixed carbon directly. So the most common way of, uh, of determining that is by, we call it by difference. So we know 100, we, we have a whole piece of biomass if we subtract out moisture, volatile matter, and ash. The only piece we're left with is fixed carbon. So usually that's just a calculated value. Um, and that's an important value for our carbonized briquette producers, right? Uh, that's essentially if we're, what we're, ideally what we're left with, uh, to make briquettes out of. Okay. So there's a, a, a student of mine did some experiments. I was just going to show you quickly a little bit of their data. Uh, this is from a few years ago, but it actually illustrates kind of nicely the proximate analysis. So the, the experiments that they did, it's called thermogravimetric analysis, TGA. Thermo, heat, gravimetric, weight, analysis, analysis. So using heat and measuring weight in real time um, on some sample. So the TGA works like this. You have a sample, a little tiny sample in a pan. So we took some, in this case, we took maize cobs. We ground them up into a powder, put them in this little pan, and then put them in a furnace, our TGA furnace. The furnace then heats up. And as it heats up, the pan is hanging, actually, from a little hook connected to a balance. So as it heats up in the furnace, we actually see all of these things coming off in a signal captured by the balance. Um, these ga gases, uh, basically for clearing out the inside of the furnace, it's called carrier gas. It removes all of the volatiles and other things coming off the sample. And we actually, in this case, we, we did some measurements on what exactly is, is being released from the biomass in real time using what's called a mass spectrometer. In that. And so that was another piece there. So then I'll show you one of the signals. Um, and I'll try to explain it real quick here. So this is our, it's, it's our mass loss. It's our gravimetric curve during the experiment. So on the x axis, we have temperature of the furnace. So the sample's going from room temperature all the way to 900 Celsius. On the right side y-axis, we have weight percentage. This is the red curve. So 100 means that was our original sample weight, right? And then it loses mass, and we're representing that as a, a percentage of the original weight. Then on the left side of the curve, um, this is the change in weight with change in temperature. And so this basically tells us how steep is the red curve, right? The slope of the red curve is the blue one. So this is pretty interesting because you can actually really clearly see each of these components being released from the biomass. So in the beginning, here on the left side of the red curve, we'll focus on the red curve, uh, we start heating it up. We heat it up to 100. You see a little bit of loss, right? Maybe less than 5%, a few percent. So this was a pretty dry sample. So there's the moisture coming out up to 100 C. Then not a lot happens from maybe 100 to 200. Continues heating, not much is coming out of the sample. But then all of a sudden, right around 220, just above 200, we see a huge surge, a huge rush of volatile matter coming out of the biomass all the way up to about four or five hundred and then it really slows down so we've driven off all of those oils all the volatile matter and there was a giant mass loss in that time right so we went from maybe 95 percent 
all the way down to around 40% in that steepest part of the curve. So that's about 50% of the original mass that was lost uh, just during the volatile matter. We call it devolatilization, removing the volatile matter. And then later, you know, we may have some heavier volatiles that take much longer, much higher temperature to cook out of the material. And in the end, the curve pretty much flattens, and this is basically our fixed carbon. So you can, we're left, fixed, sorry, fixed carbon plus ash. So in the end, we're left with somewhere around 30% of the original material remaining as fixed carbon. So I really like these experiments. And so you can basically do these, repeat this for different types of biomass. And in this case, the student of mine, Ta, her name is Ta Corrales, she did a few experiments on, mostly on maize cob. So we were really interested in that, at that time in understanding maize cobs a little better. So she actually wrote a thesis on this, and uh, I can post up a link to that at the uh, after the discussion here. Okay, so let's move quickly now. So I'm just going to put this up, and I'll share these slides. So here's here are some common materials that that we're familiar with, um, and their corresponding proximate analysis. So some of these measurements I've done, others I've taken from literature. Usually, if somebody's doing um, a research project on you know using biomass to make briquettes or using biomass for heat this is pretty much always going to be something that's required before we can really do any research or experiments we have to do, to at least get approximate analysis what you might notice here is that there's actually a big variation fairly big variation between different materials Volatile matter ranges from maybe 60 to 80 percent. Fixed carbon can be as low as 15, as high as about 30 percent. And ash goes from maybe one up to 20 percent. And the thing you'll notice kind of directly then, um, so on the bottom here, we haven't talked about it, but I think everybody's familiar with it. This is called higher heating value, HHV, or calorific value, actually. Is, a, is the same thing. Um, so higher heating value um, is it's kind of it's it's tracking very well, especially with ash content. So when we have a uh, low ash content, we generally have a higher higher heating value. And the same is true for fixed carbon. When we have a high fixed carbon content, we generally have a higher um, higher heating value. So this is the energy in the material. This is kind of ideally how much heat you could get out of the material when you burned it. So coconut shells have a lot of fixed carbon and they have the highest higher heating value. They also have pretty low ash content. Okay, so the last one, and I'm only going to do one slide on ultimate analysis because I think in practical, practically speaking, it's it's less helpful than proximate analysis, but um, it's still important. And especially when it comes to when we want to do some, say, modeling for, uh, especially for climate and environmental impacts, ultimate analysis is pretty important. It's also m much more difficult to uh, measure, and you need some special equipment uh, to measure it. And um, I think it's generally more expensive, too. So ultimate analysis is the, in, the elemental composition of the fuel. So element, you might remember from chemistry, the periodic table, the elements, uh, that big table. And so we take a few of those elements to describe most fuels are pretty much made up of, of predominantly these materials, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, chlorine, and then we sort of lump, again, we lump a lot of different things into ash, these inorganic uh, materials. We pulled chlorine out because in biomass especially, it can be a big issue. Um, so, and I'm just going to put up some examples uh, from a book, a pretty good book uh, that 
talks a lot about biomass and they, they've given us some examples here. So basically, uh, we have the percentages of each of these elements in the biomass. So carbon in general is the highest percent with oxygen. So you'll see some biomass, sugarcane bagasse has a lot of oxygen, uh, wood has quite a bit as well. But carbon is generally the highest content and then hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, um, sulfur and chlorine and ash are, are generally pretty low, although ash would be high, sorry. Um, I think one important thing when we look at this is we know that carbon in the ultimate analysis, the elemental carbon is not the same as the fixed carbon. Um, so that's an important distinction. Thick carbon as an element can actually be a part of the volatile matter as well. A lot of the carbon is actually in the volatile matter. So these oils and lignin and different things that boil out of the of the biomass um, after it's been dried, there's a lot of carbon in those. Um, so that's just one misconception that I'll point out. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, there's not a lot more that I'll say about ultimate analysis now. But it is, it does really help us, especially if we want to model, like do some estimation and modeling. We would want to know how much carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, especially, are in those. Carbon, you know, ultimately, the carbon is going to end up in some form of, usually as a greenhouse gas, right? CO2, methane, all of these things have carbon, even black carbon, the soot, right? Um, you maybe have heard about those terms. So that's going to help us estimate essentially the uh, greenhouse gas potential or global warming potential of our fuel. So, But not saying that we should have as little carbon as possible in the fuel. Uh, that's not true all either. Um, but it will give us a sense of, you know, how much... Um, yeah, how much CO2 ultimately would be released. Hydrogen and oxygen, you know, those are just going to react during pyrolysis or combustion. Uh, a lot of times they'll form in, in uh, the majority of that would form uh, water vapor, steam uh, during combustion. Okay, so that's, I think that's all I'm going to say about ultimate analysis. So just to kind of wrap up now, why is composition important for uh, char briquettes. So we'll just summarize. Um, so we know feedstock really matters, right? So different feedstocks have different compositions. And that sort of sets us as at our initial point from for where we're going to end up in the end, right? In the ash, right? We're stuck with the ash all the way until the end. Unless you have a kind of clever way of removing that, which I know some people have worked on. Um, but it's it's not very easy to do that. Process also matters, right? So um, when we carbonize, uh, depending on the environment, you know, we may actually burn away some of our fixed carbon. We'll probably remove all of our volatile matter while we're carbonizing. Um, but the efficiency of that really matters too, right? If we have some air entering into our drum kiln, that's actually going to burn away a bit of our fixed carbon, so we may not reach that kind of theoretical maximum that we could. Um, this also relates to user preferences and safety. So if you're using a high ash content feedstock, then you're carbonizing that. Your ash now has actually grown because we've removed the volatile matter. The, the amount of ash is now larger as a fraction of the total. And again, we can get you know, very ashy briquettes, which some people don't prefer. If you have, um, say, very little fix, fixed carbon in your original biomass, and mostly it's volatile matter, there are some types of biomass like that, um, then one will, will be pretty inefficient when we're carbonizing. We'll use a lot of material and produce very little char. Um, and then that'll be passed on to the user as well. It may be a lower quality briquette. For their needs, uh, less heat output. So it has a direct impact. Our feedstock has a direct impact on uh, our users' experience. 
these relate to the keb standards and i think what i'll probably do is i'll do another tech lunch on that but um we actually have standards for uh a few of these things volatile matter ash content and moisture content are all uh, uh set there's set values for those in order to achieve the standards, the standards um, performance. So I think in the next lunch, maybe we can just extend this and we'll talk about what the KEB standards or even in the discussion after we can pull that up. Um, and then, like I said, the, the ultimate analysis and, and actually both of those proximate and ultimate relate to performance and emissions estimation. So if we want to try to estimate to the uh, life cycle uh, impacts or the greenhouse gas potential for your fuel, then we'll need some of that information uh, in order to accurately estimate that. So I hope that kind of explains, you know, the relevance of those analyses uh, to briquettes. And anyone that's had testing done um, at any of the labs there uh, would know know you've seen at least the, the approximate analysis probably so uh, put up a couple resources actually one of those um, was by D lab we worked on a, an on-site testing protocol and actually came up with some tests to estimate a few of those proximate analysis uh, values so I think moisture content ash content we we found a way that we could at least get a decent estimate of those without having the expensive equipment. Um, then there's this book that I referenced called Thermal Chemical Processing of Biomass. Um, and then finally, there's a, a good resource. It's kind of old now, but um, this actually, this, this report by Domalski lists a lot of different types of biomass by their plant type so trees uh, crop wastes um, yeah a lot of different types and then it lists out a lot of these um, data for each of the types of biomass so in most cases they provide a approximate analysis in a lot of cases they also provide an ultimate analysis um, so this is kind of a nice summary resource say if you were thinking about a new material you could actually go and look at Domalski or even online, there's a lot of that now um, to try to, to estimate um, what the composition of that fuel would be.